My name is Marcy Semenskin. I'm the founder of Save Lexington Wildlife. On, behi on behalf of Save Lexington Wildlife, an indivisible lab, which is Lexington, Arlington, Bedford, and beyond, I would like to welcome you all to Road to Control, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. A version of this presentation was given last year, and, um, and a lot has happened since, and so we wanted to repeat this performance. And so, uh, first off, there's a lot more cities and towns that are working on this issue. So, you know, Arlington and Newton have filed home rule petitions at the state, but there's also activity in Newbury, um, Somerville, Waltham, Belmont, Woburn, and I talked to a woman today from Pepperell. There's probably even more. Um, so there's a lot of activity, and there's also a lot more data on available. So there's a now there's a pesticide usage database on the state website, and there's actually even an app to collect data on bait box locations. And so, uh, anyway, Save Lexington Wildlife was created in October of 2023 with the goal of reducing or eliminating the use of anticoagulant rodenticides in the town of Lexington. We have a citizen article at town meeting which starts on March 18th. We are Article 40. Article 40 asks the town to develop integrated pest management policies for the town that prohibit the use of second generation anticoagulant rodenticides on town properties. It also asks for education on the dangers and alternatives to SGARs. For more information on this article, you can go to the town website and there's a video presentation, a slide deck, and other information there. I hope that anybody in this room that's a resident of Lexington will support our article. Before introducing the speakers, I would like to acknowledge a few key people in the audience. We have Cindy Savage and Karen Hartford. They've worked tire tirelessly to get the word out about this event and this group. I would also like to acknowledge folks from other groups that are here. I believe that we have people from Woburn, Waltham, Newbury, and potentially others. And, and if possible, please raise your hand and just say what group you're from. Uh, so, Nicole, I'm from Save Newbury Wildlife. Carlton Willard Village in Bedford. Uh, are you asking for other towns? Yeah, other groups. We're just trying to get organized. Okay. A former Townsend Nash resident. Okay. I now live in New Hampshire, so I'm working both places. And Broughton, and we've got a couple other people here that are working with us. We'll have a couple more from Pepco. Mm -hmm. We've had started organizing. So last year when we held this talk, a couple people that came went back to their town and started a group. It's a lot easier to talk about now. So like I believe that Save Belmont Wildlife was spawned from coming to this group. So I'm really hoping that once again, people in this audience will go back and start groups in their own town. Um, so this time I'd like to introduce the speakers. So we have Gary Menon, he's an engineer by training and experience. He began his career working at power plants, but as his career progressed, he began to focus on how to run these devices without harming the health and safety of people or the environment. He trained people in 16 states and four countries in environmental health and safety management. Gary then took his teaching ability into the high school classroom, teaching physics. He is now retired, but he is still teaching, training, and working to protect the environment as an advocate for all activities working towards the elimination of poisonous rodenticides. He would like everyone to know that he's more than willing to give this presentation um, at any location within 100 miles of Sterling Mass. We also have Gary to thank for this great image that we all use on our signs and t-shirts. We also have Laura, Laura Kaisel. Uh, Laura is academically trained as a wildlife biologist. She's a naturalist, a conservation advocate, and environmental journalist. Her articles and op-eds have appeared in Salon, the Boston Globe, the Washington Post, Earth Island, Island Journal, Science, Inside Climate News, The Atlantic, and many other outlets. She's the founder of Save Arlington Wildlife and the Save Massachusetts Wildlife Education Fund. 
So without further ado, we'll get started with our presentation. Thank you very much, Marcy, for having me today. Thank you. The, uh, the purpose of this slide is really a single fold here. Please take down my email address and my phone number. Uh, the whole purpose of all this is to raise awareness and for you to take the message and spread it around wherever you can. And if you have questions or concerns that are not, not answered today, that come up later, which undoubtedly they will, email me, call me up. My intent is to answer every single call and email that I get. If I do not, it means it probably went into the spam folder. So keep bugging me until I answer you. Um, how did I get here? I got I got to kind of, oops, kind of blow through these slides here fairly quickly as I start because I don't want to. Uh, I want to. I want to get into the good part of this, the alternatives to poisons, and that good part of this is over in this section where I want to demonstrate anything, everything that is alternatives to these bad things right here. Uh, what got me involved with all of this was back when I was about ten years old. That's me. We had unfortunately found a a great horned owl that had been hit by a car. And that stoked my interest. It was, a, it was a fabulous creature that I had never seen anything the likes of that before. The talents were, were amazing and uh, got me to read this book right here, which I subsequently bought. And uh, my interest has continued from that day forward over several decades, or a newer six decades, actually. Uh, in any event, um, but uh, really what's compelling me is the statistics here that that Marcy identified to me just the other day, which I pretty much knew about, because you can walk about anywhere you want, almost any town, you're gonna to find these kicking around. These are, the, these are the bad and the ugly right here. These are bait boxes, and you can find them everywhere. I find them in places where you wouldn't think you'd need to find them, an office building, for example. Anyway, look at this statistic here. In 2022, greater than 265 tons of this poison was distributed in Massachusetts alone, and this is just, of the second generation anticoagulant rodenticide. What about all the others that you buy at Home Depot, the first generation? And the non-anticoagulants, the neurotoxins, how many tons of that is being distributed? It's no wonder that nearly 100% of our raptors have some level of poison in their viscera. We're poisoning everything. And that's really what's compelling me. The, uh, the thing which uh, co for continued to raise my attention actually before I saw that statistic was this article that I came across just on a Google search. And it was an article that uh, was written by a fellow by the name of Ted Williams, not the baseball player, um, a, a journalist, who was interviewing this, this young lady here, Dr. Maureen Murray of the Tufts Cumming School of Veterinary Medicine in Grafton, Massachusetts, which isn't too far from here. I've taken my dog there on occasion. And uh, he was interviewing her as she was doing uh, necropsies of raptors that had been poisoned. And uh, I know it's not generally advisable to, to read your slides here. However, I think it's worthy of reading the slides. Um, a red-tailed hawk here on the left with a hematoma that had ballooned to its, its left side at 10 times its normal side. This is really, to a person like myself, and I'm sure most of you here, this is kind of wrenching information. It kind of really bothers you. It bothered me internally as well. And a great horned owl with a hematoma hematoma running the length of its wing. These are internal bleeding episodes that are caused by these anticoagulant rodenticides, especially the second generation ones. And saddest of all, the red tail with an egg, the well-developed blood vessels in her oviducts had ruptured and she had slowly been bled to death from the inside. So we're killing our natural rodent controls. And all these, all these raptors that she was reviewing had been poisoned and they died an anguishing death as a result of these poisons. They're used, as you can see, how many tons are being used. It's a big, big problem. And I'm sure Laurel will give you more information relative to other, especially the eagles in this area that have been killed on the order of, I think it was four of them that have been killed with poison. Bald eagles, it, it takes a long time, a lot of effort to reintroduce bald eagles into this area. It's called a hacking process. They started it up. They brought the eagles in from places like Pennsylvania and Canada and Alaska. And they hack them, they call it hacking, where they introduce them to an area like they started out with Quabbin Reservoir. This takes hours and hours and weeks and months and years to get them reintroduced. And people put on <clears> poisons, <throat> and we're poisoning them just like that. Extremely sad. More statistics. The, the statistics are never ending. A really touching was just a few years ago, snowy owls, which uh, had, had migrated down from Canada and, and places north, 
nine of them were poisoned in Massachusetts alone, at Lo <laughs> all of which were at Logan Airport. These are beautiful birds. And we're, I haven't even seen one in a while myself. And so it's, it's just atrocious. Um, I have a, a, there's an option in Google. If you're, you have Google Mail, you can put in for an alert. And I put in rat and poison as an alert. So anytime rat and poison appear in an article, I get an alert. And you can do this any day. Every day I get <laughs> alerts to this. This is just a, a sampling of what I've, what I've gotten just in you know, early February, late January. It's continuous. These, uh, these statistics, as I say, continue. This was in wild care in Cape Cod. Uh, they identified it as the first bald eagle that was poisoned. There was some question as whether that was actually being poisoned or was it some other, a binescar or some other toxic agent. Um, <clears throat> this was from Cape Ann, a red-tailed hawk, great horned owl in Cape Cod. Um, and pretty much nationwide, our eagles, both bald and golden eagles, are being poisoned at an incredible rate. It's really horrific. This was uh, the, the first eagle that was poisoned here locally, which was uh, in Waltham. Um, and this was a this was a you know a pregnant female. They were not only killing that one bird, but but her offspring. It's it's it's, it's atrocious. Um, I'm not. I guess the question that you know that we don't talk about much because we don't have a lot of data on it is for every eagle or every owl or every hawk that we actually find that has been determined to be poison, how many are out there in the wild that are dying unnoticed? Is that ratio one to ten? I'm not sure, but I'm, I'm sure it's better than one to one. And of course, there's also the issue that <clears throat> acute death is not always the only symptom. You say, what about the, the accumulation of these poisons in the viscera of the animal? of the bird over time. What does that do to their reproductive ability? What does it do with their hunting skills? If you were, if you'd have blood tests uh, uh, today or tomorrow, and it was part of your annual physical and you found out you had brodificum in your system, it wouldn't be too comforting, would it? Would you have rat poison in your system? And with this level of poisons that we're using, um, similarly it's gonna happen. Uh, about a year ago when I was doing this presentation, that very day a bald eagle had died in New Hampshire. So it's, it's, a, it's a significant problem, and our raptors are at risk. Um, of, a, after analyzing all 557 raptor species, this goes back a couple of years ago now, um, to 2018, so that's six years ago now. And that time it was discovered 18% of these birds are threatened with extinction, and 52% have declining populations. It's only gotten worse. And, and uh, not only, of course, are we killing our main uh, rodent control agents that are out there in a while doing their thing. But also think about, you know, the, the effect on us directly. Um, Lyme disease, the main vector for Lyme disease is the white-footed mouse. It's not the white-tailed ale, it's a white-footed mouse. It's the, the most prolific controlling agent of the white-footed mouse here in Massachusetts is the barred owl. That's what they eat all day long, white-footed mice. And so here we are killing our barred owls and in doing that, the white-footed mouse tends to proliferate greater and is carrying Lyme disease. Um, I've had, uh, I've been bitten by ticks. I've had to get the, the doxycycline to go through the process to make sure it didn't develop into something worse. And I'm, I'm, I'm guessing many of you have had a similar experiences with ticks. You have to check yourself every time you go out. And if you see a tick that's in, embedded in you, you got to take that seriously. It could cause a really debil debilitating disease, Lyme disease and several other diseases as well. And so what are we doing? We're killing our, our main control agents. So we're, uh, so we're killing our main rodent control uh, uh, vectors, our, our hawks, owls, and eagles, and in addition to foxes and, other, and wild bobcats, other animals are also getting poisoned. But as far as my, my personal concern, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm in the twilight zone of my life, you know, I'm, in, I'm up there. And, uh, I'm thinking about my grandchildren right now. What are they going to be growing up with? And that's really what I'm doing this for. I hope they are around along with the ox, owls, and eagles so they can grow up enjoying them as well. So uh, quickly, how does this, uh, how do these poisons work? I think you pretty much are, most people are kind of aware of this. And I might say, how many people in this room are using poisons in their house? 
are you, you are using poison? Well, I hope to convince you to stop using poison because that's my bar, my low bar for success is to convince one person in any given audience to swear off these poisons, to take your decon and return it to Home Depot and start using some of these other methods. That's my goal. Okay, is to, that's, if, I, if I get that goal, convincing one family to, to swear off poisons, I'm convinced that I will have saved some hawk, owl, or eagle family somewhere, and thereby I'm successful. I believe I'm successful. Um, most of you are not using poisons. So it's up to you, I would say, that to spread the word to your neighbors and friends that, that uh, whether they are using them or not, to keep spreading the word so that they, you know, that they don't think about it as an option. So the rodent eats the bait. The, all these bad baits up here. These are, uh, this is a brodificum. This is an actual, if you cannot buy this presumably in a store anymore, but you can order it on Amazon. Uh, the, uh, the rodent eats the bait. Poison makes the, the rat thirsty. They start dehydrating because of the internal bleeding. They seek out water. They become weak in state. They're an easy target for the predator. Uh, the predator dies as well of internal bleeding. They, these, these rodents, they, they proliferate exponentially, whereas the hawks, owls, and eagles, they might have one clutch a year, and only 50% of that brood survives, even with or without poisons. So they don't have a chance to build up any immunity. Uh, Brodificum is one of the preeminent ones. I've got some Brodificum right here. Some of these other uh, agents here are, are first generation, but this is an actual bona fide second generation anticoagulant rodenticide. And I've got to be careful with this. I've got to keep this basically in a locked cabinet so my, my dog doesn't get into it, which would be a, which would be a bad scene. Um, it was discovered, this, this, uh, this agent was discovered actually in, in uh, uh, rotting uh, alfalfa, I think it was, where they, they, were, they discovered that the cows that were eating this alfalfa were hemorrhaging and they investigated this and they found this, this compound was being created in the, uh, the, the spoiling of the, uh, the alfalfa. And they were able to isolate it and they used this, uh, this, this particular chemical as a subsequent poison for rodents. It's also used as a heart medicine. Warfarin is a first generation anticoagulant, but it's used as a heart, heart medicine to thin the blood. blood. People that have uh, issues with uh, coagulating, mm -hmm. They actually give that to, to uh, heart patients. I know my father was on that for a while. Um, as I said, these, uh, these bait boxes can be found just about anywhere. And one of the things that I found that exterminators will say that these uh, bait boxes, they're, 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 uh, they're, the rodent re they're resistant to tamper. They're tamper proof. Well, that's untrue. Any, any, any rodent can chew through anything and they will not, they cannot be tamper proof. They cannot be somehow to be contained by this rodent. If the rodent is, wants to get in there, they'll get in there and uh, they'll tear it apart if necessary. In fact, in Arlington, a situation where gray squirrels were distributing the poison throughout the town. They were taking them, either going into these bait boxes and they were ripping them apart and taking the poison packets out of there and distributing them through the town like they were hiding acorns or whatever. And so, uh, of course, they did not know what they were doing, but that's what, they were, that's what it, the end result was. These are some of the uh, technical terms for the various types of anticoagulants. The ones that we're concentrating on today are, the, are these here. But I must say, poisons are poisons, and I don't recommend poisons of any kind to anybody. There are many alternatives. I had a handout sheet here that I had just a few copies of. Um, if you want it, if you didn't get a copy, by all means, call me, email me. I will send you a, a reproducible copy. So there's poison is poison. Ultimately. The more you use another poison, you're going to find out that, uh, son of a gun, that's as bad as the second generation was because more people are using it. As I said, I uh, actually I actually bought a, a, uh, an eight-pound bag of this, this uh, Grodificum on Amazon. I ordered it one day, and the next day it was at my front door. Presumably, like the government, the EPA, said, well, we banned all sales to consumers. Well, they haven't banned this. Okay, Anybody can order this notwithstanding the so-called presumable, presumable law that the EPA had instituted that prohibited the ordinary consumer from buying these second generations. I did it. I proved it. We have it, we have it here. I actually subsequently wrote a, a review of this, this, uh, this sale. I said this is a, it's, you know, it's false advertising. These are not safe for the environment. 
they're, they're killing every day. And uh, of course, Amazon didn't like the idea of what I was saying, and they didn't publish my review. Um, so uh, this again is the uh, this is this is the real ugly thing here. I've already showed you this slide, but 250 265 tons in one year, tons in Massachusetts alone, really. Well, if you walk walk through uh, any restaurant zone through Boston and neighboring towns, you're going to find these bait boxes everywhere. So it's not very surprising. So why are they so pre prevalent? Because, you know, being an exterminator is uh, is labor intensive. You're not going to want to come out and set little mouse traps or rat traps and have to clear them for the con the uh, the, uh, the customer every day. That's, that's a lot of a lot of labor involved. They want to come out and put this bait box there and come around later and, and fill it up again, maybe a month later. Like the cable guy, they want a recurring audience with minimal labor. Uh, oddly enough, what it does, in my opinion, from what I've seen in the research, it tends to attract rodents to the, to the area. You're putting out a food source. Okay. Um, by the way, another reason why you might not want to use poison has nothing to do with raptors per se or any other wild animal. The fact that if you do poison an animal, where does it go when it actually dies? If it's not picked up by a by an hawk or an owl, well, it's going to go behind a wall somewhere, and it's going to die die behind a sheetrock in your house, and it's going to have a very Nefarious odor emanating from behind your sheetrock, not a good thing that you want these ant rodents dying there. So uh, these these birds of prey, all these wild animals, they got a they got a tough row to hoe right from the very get go. If they, as I said, one clutch of two owls' eggs from, let's say, a great horned owl, or a barred owl, or a screech owl, the likelihood that they survive in one for over one year is only fifty percent. Okay. Whereas rodents proliferate exponentially, thousands of them, from a single single uh, mating pair over the course of a year. This statistic said on the order of 1,250 from a single pair over the course of a year. So they build up immunities to these things. Eventually, they'll build up an immunity to, to eschars as well because it's evolutionary. You know, they, they have so many of them. So the, there's nothing good about these poisons, whether it's an escar, an fgar, or a neurotoxin of some sort of a ricin or cyanide. Poison is poison, and it's not good for the environment, and it's not good for these for us or these species. I've got these handouts here that you're welcome to take um, for your own edification and subsequent research. And if you want more of these, I can get them for you. I got them from an organization known as Raptors Are the Solution. There's a little be banner behind behind the cl classroom here, uh, which features that organization. It's RaptorsAreTheSolution.org, all one word, and they are a preeminent organization that's really fighting this. They've been fighting this for well over a decade now, and they're making progress, but the progress is painfully slow, uh, even in, in Massachusetts as well. Now, each one of these these creatures on this handout here, which is shown on this slide, every single one of those creatures, whether that's flora or fauna, right down to, you know, the, the flowering plants down below and caterpillars and earthworms. There are certain selected uh, species or samples of those species which have been proven to be rodenticide positive. So what can we do right now to, to stop this? Well, raise awareness. The biggest thing we can do right now is to raise awareness. That's our most important tool. Let people know what's going on because they, they just go to Home Depot, they buy this, they go and pop, pop it down. And don't realize the danger that it's involved and what's happening. So don't use poison. If you're going to hire a, an ex exterminating company, you know, insist that they use non-poisonous methods. They can do that. It may be more costly, but they can do that. They can and will do it. There are people that you can seek out that will do it. Not every single one of them, but I did the survey in central Massachusetts, and I was quickly able to find on the order of three right off the bat that were willing to come to my area I was just doing a little test case, and use non-poisonous methods. This, by the way, is a, a picture of a red-tailed hawk here, and he's eating a viscera of some rodent which has been poisoned. How do we know it's poisoned? Because, see this blue coloration? The, uh, the manufacturers of the escar or the fgar, they actually put this dye into the, the, into the, uh, the pellets of the rodenticide, and that dye comes out in the viscera. You can see the blue coloration. So that poor red-tailed hawk, which thinks he's doing us all a favor, having a good meal, is actually poisoning himself. Um, what can we do to raise awareness? Letters to the editor of your local newspapers. 
and the legislators do presentations like this. I'd be willing to, to do presentations, as I say, as uh, Marcy has indicated, just about anywhere in, you know, out of Massachusetts here within a few hour drive. But I'm also willing to, to provide my PowerPoint presentation to anybody who wants to do it on their own. Um, this is not, nothing's copyrighted here. I have no problem with anybody using it. If you, uh, if you email me, call me, I will send you a thumb drive or send you the file, put it on a Google Drive or whatever, and so you can all use this as you see fit, hopefully spreading the word. Um, one of the biggest, the most important people throughout of this is, of course, people like yourselves that are taking an interest in this, people like Marcy and, and Laura that are driving this point home every day, but also the re your local rehabbers. Those are the people that are on the front lines of this. They're dealing with the anguish daily of these rodents that are coming in, of these mammals that are coming in poison. And uh, they have a lot of a lot of courage. I mean, they're taking, they're taking great risk while they're doing this. Um, and they are just doing an amazing job. So if I, would, if I were to be asked, who would you donate to to, to uh, support this effort? Find out who your local rehabber is and, and give them a hand. There are three bills that are currently active. Um, in my opinion, things are going painfully slow. These bills, House 825, H, House 814, and H 804, these numbers change periodically. Uh, so it's a little bit difficult sometimes to keep track of them. But retro legislators urge them to pass these, to get moving on these. It's an arduous process. It's, it's, uh, it's insufferable, in my opinion. I mean, it just, it just kind of, I've written so many letters on this subject, I feel like, oh, it's Gary Menon again, writing another letter. You know, it's covered in a round file, you know. So let's talk about alternatives. I, I did hand out a sheet of what I think I summarized many, many alternatives. With C, please come to the front desk. Please, with C, please come to the front desk. Thank you. Well, I'm not Steve, so anyway. So, uh, let's talk about uh, some of these alternatives. I'm going to go through, go through some of them. I'm going to talk about, these are all, this, now we're in, we've, we've got out of the, the bed and the ugly, that 265 ton thing, which is really ugly. I think that's an atrocious statistic. Let's talk about the good. What can we do as alternatives? Well, you can use snap traps for the ordinary mice, the old fashioned, you know, Victor mouse trap. They've got a new design now, which, which sets very easily, like, just like I just set it just now. You can unset it by doing that. These are for mice, for the smallest creatures. If you want to use, catch rats in snap traps, I, this is a, a gang set here of rat traps, four of them in a row in parallel. And uh, it's a setup so that you can set them, all four of them, if you're careful without, without breaking your finger. You don't want to get, you don't want to have your uh, finger snapped on one of these rat traps. It'll, it can break your finger quite easily. So what are all some of the alternatives here? Yeah. Um, a house cat. We had a house cat, unfortunately, passed away recently, but on, on the order of, uh, she would take care of on the order of four mice every fall. Mm -hmm. um, I had to supplement her with ultrasound of repellers and other types of repellers I'll talk to about here shortly. Um, but I do plan to get another cat because I can keep, keep your cats indoor, do not let them outside. They, they do, do an inordinate amount of killing of beneficial wildlife. Keep them indoors, they, they'll find indoors. Don't keep them too well fed, you know, keep them fed, but not too well fed. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, place the snap traps, I find that the snap traps are effective. I, I did have a camera set up on one of my snap traps and I actually watched a mouse at a trigger and something was, something was at a motion detection on this camera. And there was a mouse going around this snap trap and the cheese in there, just a classic cheese snap trap. And he was sniffing around it, sniffing around it, walked around it several times and then left. So he knew something was up. So they're not, they're not dumb. Uh, let's see, I'd like to show you a little video here. I'll wait a minute here. Not, not ready yet. Let's talk about some of the other methods. Um, some people will say that uh, bounce dryer sheets are a good effect. If you have an automobile in your garage, you can place dryer sheets, you know, on the air cleaner of the engine compartment, or you can put it inside. Unfortunately, um, I'm going to I'm going to nix that idea because I did that. I had my dryer sheet set on the air cleaner here. I came back oh, a week or so later. There's a dryer sheet with some. Sunflower seeds all cracked open on, on top of the dryer. <laughs> so he was using it as a picnic table. <laughs> so I, I wouldn't recommend dryer sheets. They don't, they don't work. Okay. Other things that, uh, that do work 
um, instant mashed potato flakes, say, are as effective as this, this, this non-toxic poison. Mouse X, have you heard about mouse X? Mouse X, they have mouse X and rat X. Basically, it's pellets that uh, apparently, because rodents cannot regurgitate, they, uh, these mouse X pellets and or instant mashed potato flakes swell up in the viscera of the, in the GI tract of the mouse or the rat. They cannot regurgitate, they swell up, and they die of a GI asphyxiation, basically. Now, you don't need to get organic mashed potatoes, any kind of mashed potatoes is fine. <laughs> and I, I actually would suggest you not get roasted garlic because they might not like the garlic ones. Uh, there's other, other types of these little, these little mint packets. You place them in areas where the mice are likely to come in. And uh, also something like this, which is a uh, mint-based spray. And what I do is uh, along my garage door seal, I spray along that about once every other week. And my, uh, any, my, all my thresholds that I, where the mice could come in, they can get in incredibly small spaces on the order of the size of a circumference or the diameter of a dime. So they can somehow, they can get in through a diameter of a dime. I don't know how they do that, but that's what I've been told. So I spray this mint spray there. They seem to be working pretty well. I haven't had any problems recently. And there's something else called mouse balls. My wife said, what, what do you get mouse balls for? Is that some sort of delicacy? I said, no, this is, a, <laughs> this is these are the little, these little balls, which have mint in them. And you turn them 90 or 40 degrees, and basically they you just throw a few in your car. You've got a car in a garage. And presumably they don't like the mint motor, which is the same motor that comes from the spray. And it will keep the mice out of the out of the vehicle. Uh, what else do we have? Okay, we have a we have some live traps here. This is a live trap where you could perhaps relocate the animal. I understand that uh, technically that's you know, I think that's illegal to relocate unless you relocate it on your own property. Uh, but it's, it's, it's better than poisoning. And uh, you know who hasn't gone. Who hasn't gone 70 miles an hour on a nice turnpike? That's illegal to you. So, uh, <laughs> now this is a this is a got this tape across this device. This is called the the uh, Good Nature A24 rodent trap. It's an instant instantaneous kill trap. It's it's uh, self powered with a CO2 canister here. It has a little counter on this. Tells how many hits you've gotten. And presumably it's good for 24 hits in a year's cycle. And uh, basically you put the bait in the top here. I've got this type of bait, which I actually bought from an exterminator. They recommend this type of bait, which is made by Bell Labs. And you put it in this little canister at the top. The rodent smells it. They're wandering around. They walk in here and they... There it goes. It, 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 it presumably will kill them in one hit. They drop away, it resets automatically, the bait is still there, they drop away dead, presumably, and then when an opossum comes along, take it, the opossum or the raccoon doesn't get poisoned, it has a free meal, and so it's kind of recycling while it's doing that. Other types of things that you can do, there's a, a service called Cat's Eye, which is an exclusion service, they'll come to your house and they'll guarantee that they can exclude the rodents from your house. They seal up all entrances and they, they, they revisit the house on an annual basis. However, the downside is it's quite expensive. I had a quote on my house and they wanted like eight grand to do my house. That's, that was prohibitively expensive for me at the time. But uh, mice can do a lot of damage to your house if, you, if they get in and they, 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 they build up a, a nest there. Another electronic trap is this Victor electronic rat trap. And uh, it's got the battery powered. It charges a capacitor. And I have a little piece of sausage here. I'm trying to simulate what actually happens. Maybe you can hear it when it goes. I have one of those for wild mice, and it's, it's, it's good. And actually, it was kind of funny because after the mouse dies, which no blood, no mess, I buried it in my yard because it's not poisoned. Somebody said you should hang it up for the birds. <laughs> but, put it on uh, a spike and it'll go out of the Some of the other the devices are uh, these repellers. 
anybody can anybody hear this? Can't see. You can generally tell the, the age of your audience if they can't hear this. This is the second level. Can you go to the front of the room? Is that possible? I can't, I can't see see what you're. Try bring it a little closer. This is a three has a three setting um, ultrasonic sound wave coming out. So that's the lowest setting. It's red light, green light, and blue light. Blue light. That's the highest setting. Can anybody hear? Nobody can hear that. No. Now, if I were to be playing this with my kids in the house or my grandchildren, they can hear it right away. In fact, I come in the house. I got these in my house. They say, "There's an alarm going off in the basement. What's going on?" <laughs> I can't hear the alarm. Like, where's the where's the alarm? They bring me down there. It is. And I this. Now, the, the problem with getting this device as a repeller, if you should lose power and power re is, re comes on again, it goes to the lowest setting. Okay? So the preferable one, if you have a situation where you have power loss, it's like in a, like in a garage or an outbuilding, uh, it's preferable to get one which has a single setting on it, which is this type. It's a single setting. So when power goes off and it's reset, it comes back to that same setting. And you don't have to worry about going down and reset it as you would with the other type. Uh, let's see. Let's see. I've gone over most of these here. Rad X, mashed potatoes. Very bad, these glue traps. Please do not use glue traps. They are horrific. Uh, I think they should be banned. They catch a lot of animals that you don't want to catch. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a chemical out there now called Contrapest which is basically a rodent birth control method. It, it affects their fertility. And towns like, uh, like Somerville have, have used this with great success, I understand. Um, but first, of course, is, uh, is cleanliness in the case of uh, rodents. You want to remove their food source. If you do not remove their food source, it's going to be a heck of a, heck of a time trying to get rid of them. Um, there's other, uh, other methods which are being promoted in and major urban areas like uh, internet, Wi-Fi connected rat traps that, that tell the, the town rodent control specialists where the traps are being tripped and how often they're being tripped. Um, again, these uh, they're smart. These animals are smart. I'm going to show you how, just how smart they are. Let's see if this thing gets going here. <laughs> Aren't you going? I'm not sure why he's not moving. It was working a minute ago. Maybe he's dead. I do not know why he's not moving. But it did, it basically, it, it, it uh, was in all my thunder here with this slide, but basically it shows this rodent, he actually takes a pencil, a piece of stick, and actually trips the trap. Um, you can, and you can, you can do a Google search on it, it's right online. Um, you know, the, the question is, are they, are they eating the poison? Are these rats eating the poison? I, I talked to Andrew Costum, someone that I here knows Andrew Costum, and uh, he, uh, very active in, in working against poisons and he uh, he has found that these bald eagles were actually eating rats. They were not, they were not eating fish, they were eating rats. And uh, I had occasion where I was trying to uh, catch some rats that were in a neighbor's out building, it was a, like, a, uh, like a garage, if you will, and he kept his, kept his hunting dogs in there. Oh. And uh, we tried to catch these rats and I had this four gang trap here I had the electronic trap over on the right. I had two basic snap traps and I had my my uh, trail cam looking at it. And over here, I had sample, sample uh, baits that were provided by the, uh, the company that sold the A24 rat trap to see which they preferred. They didn't touch any of it. I actually had the process where I would set, I wouldn't set these traps. I just put sprinkled sunflower seeds, peanut butter, cheese, whatever over the course of several days, in fact, a couple of weeks, without the traps being set. The idea to get him the use it, that they were safe. You could walk around there at your free will, eat, your, eat, your, eat the bait, and nothing would happen to you. And uh, they were eating the bait. 
As soon as I set the traps, we were successful in catching only one rat, one rat over this, this course of several weeks here. And here's the, you can barely see the pictures of these, these rodents, but that's what trail cam picked up. I guess if you squint, you can see them. But there were, there were rats all over the place. We caught only one rat. And I think he tripped and fell into one of the traps. <laughs> <laughs> Ultimately, we, uh, we want to get to the namesake of this organization, Raptors Are the Solution. We're looking to get the raptors to take care of these animals, not poison. Because they are proficient at doing it. We just let them alone and didn't poison them. You know, one, one red shoulder hawk can kill on the order of 30 rodents in a month. That's a, that's a rat per day. And you, you'd be able to see the proof if you were near a nest box of a, of a barn owl. You know, I, I was reading the book, uh, was it Inferno by Dan Brown? He was of the fame, I think, of the, he'd written a book, The Da Vinci Code. Yeah, back, and he, he wrote a subsequent book called The Inferno. And in, in that, it was a statistic that a, that every month, an additional 10 million humans are on the planet, every single month. And so we're going to have to, if we're going to have these animals around us, we're going to have to learn to coexist with them. And that means stop using poison, among other things. And in, in addition, how about trying to attract the raptors to your yard? You can put up perches. They, raptors like to fly to a location where they can have a good view of the surrounding and sit there. They're very patient. They just sit there silently and watch for the rodents. And if we can attract them to our yards and coexist with them, they can be your natural, uh, natural uh, rodent controllers. Um, now there's a there's other things you can do to raise awareness. I won't get into too much detail here because I think I'm running kind of short of time. Um, something called the All Wise Leader Program. If you can get any organization to swear up poison, any restaurant, um, any building like the Lexington uh, Community Center. We can make a big deal out of that, have a little newsworthy event, and give them a certificate and advertise that this is another organization that has sworn off rodenticides. This was in Arlington, and it was at the uh, it was at a place on Main Street. It was the Butternut Bakery when they swore that off, and they get a little they get a little uh, sticker to put on their window. Remember the Allwise Leader Fund. Again, it's all about raising awareness. So with that, I'm going to close the presentation. If uh, uh, Laura is going to be the second presenter here, and I guess after that, then you can. This time, we can have a question and answer period. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can you help me plug it in? Um, again, I'm going to disconnect myself. Um, my jacket is missing, and the room filled up so quick. And I just had my jacket on one of these chairs that by the time, oh, there it is. Okay, great. I was like, where did my jacket go when I came in? Okay, great. Good to know. I went to the bathroom and I came back and it was full and I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know where it went. Here you go. Okay. Can you... Does anybody have any doubt about how many rats these raptors eat? Lately, I've become obsessed with searching Google. Can I put it on there too? Yeah. It's these owl boxes. And like they have the one that have like five basic outlets. Hey, Eric. And yeah, and they is it multiple wraps tonight? The the. But if you if you shut down and restart it, you think it might connect? It's amazing. I did email my thing to you, so I could also go through your computer. I'll in the meantime. You can if you can't get it going, I will. It might come up if you shut down and restart. I've done that on occasion. Which, which email did you send it to? Well, I think some of them might email. Be the email. I don't even know who had a Gmail. I sent it to your Yahoo and the something like MSN or Net. Okay, all right. I sent it to those. I'll look at Yahoo. But it's fascinating to watch. Is there a listing? I wanted to get a list of each specific owl and hawk and how many. Um, I mean, I don't understand how this stuff works. That they it's, a, it's what happened in Swamp Scott, where it's not reading the, the screen. The so I'm probably just going to work with him. Because it's just not. Do you have a listing like that? Or? I don't. No. I would like to add, too, that crows eat them. I have a picture of a crow with a rodent. And blue herons eat them. Blue herons don't just eat fish. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's the more you look at it, the more exponentially 
expensive it is, so we could fill in blue herons for... It says I need, need yeah. access. Okay. okay. This is, to just get exponentially larger. Yeah. What is your Gmail? Because I, I think if you had Gmails, it would... Gmail, same night. Gmail, senior at Gmail.com. speculation that they would identify. If you go to barrel farming in Concord, then you would park sitting looking out at sort of the fields around like large blue herons, um, the great blue heron hunt along the edges of there and catch mice. And so and then they hit them and they're up and down the throat. Okay, and so it's GC men and senior at Gmail, GC. that's right there. Oh, it did read you. It didn't come up before. Okay. So hopefully now it'll work since it's your Gmail. For exclusion, I know we end up having a... Sorry about this. ...flying squirrel in our house that came in through these attics. You know, we didn't know it was a flying squirrel. Every night there was a... Okay, I'm going to take this off your PC and let's take it back on that. And so... I decided it was... Put it underneath the table here. Yeah. Metal mesh all along the roof So it's, in some sense, it's not even just mice that are coming in at the down level. The things coming up above. But yes, I mean, it was expensive, but it's all very Yay, hey, finally. Yay. <laughs> Technology does not like me. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit more, I'm going to shrink down the focus a little bit to like what happened in Arlington to start off the Save Arlington Wildlife Campaign and, and my journey on this issue. So as it was mentioned during um, my introduction, my academic background is in wildlife biology. I worked in conservation advocacy for many years. Um, in 2015, I came out of my apartment one day and the person was laying down 20 bait stations. This was an affordable housing complex in Arlington. And I knew what was in these bait stations. I knew how they worked. I said to the pest control um, professional, I said, if my cat eats a mouse that's eaten this bait or if the red-tailed hawks nesting around the corner do, they'll die. He's like, no, they won't. Um, so I went to the landlord. The landlord at first was alarmed, but the pest control uh, professional told him I did not know what I was talking about, so those bait stations stayed. Um, and I started to get very involved over, and this was in 2015, over the next several years, going to my board of health, going to the conservation commission, very alarmed and saying that my concern was if we did not stop this, because prior to 2015, I wasn't really seeing bait stations, but within a year, um, I started seeing them proliferate around my town and around the entire metro area. I said, I think we're going to start to have a domino effect where we're going to start seeing animals dropping down that we're, when we're not expecting it. In 2018, I wrote my first feature article on this issue. I'm an environmental journalist, so I wanted to cover it. Um, and this was in Dig Boston. And I also talked a lot about Somerville's integrated pest management program in this one. 2021, I did a follow-up piece because Arlington lost its first bald eagle, um, which I'll discuss a little bit more in a few minutes. And this piece was then um, syndicated in Salon as a cover story, and it was shortlisted for the David Carr Award for investigative reporting. There's been kind of a media blackout on this issue, though it's finally starting to get more attention in the mainstream media. Um, but when, the, when our eagle died and we started getting other wildlife deaths in Arlington, uh, it was clear that we needed to have more organizational representation. We couldn't just be a loose group of individuals. So I started a website called SaveArlingtonWildlife.org. And I just want to explain a little bit why I chose that moniker is because I think a lot of times people think of wildlife as somewhere else. You know, their wildlife are in these remote rural areas. I in conservation, I worked in Alaska on wildlife conservation issues. I've seen more wildlife here in this area than I saw when I was living and working in Alaska. I saw one bald eagle once, like a mile away in the foggy distance in Alaska. And we had bald eagles in my backyard almost virtually here in Arlington that I could see every day that would come within 10 feet of me. Um, so I just wanted to, to, to say something to that. And so I founded that in like late... 2021, early 2022, to raise awareness about rodenticides in the town. And after MK the Eagle died, um, more and more communities started showing interest. And so um, sometimes I work with them to help collaborate and see, talk to them about what we've done here in Arlington. And 
And now there are Save Wildlife chapters and initiatives here in Lexington, Belmont, Newberry, Waltham, and now there's one that just started in Somerville. And I'm really excited because when so Somerville has already made um, a commitment to uh, get rid of all escars on their public lands. Um, so this was what I was just talking about. You know, wildlife, we have a rich biodiversity in our own backyards right here in the suburban and an urban metro area of Boston. And um, it was sort of, it got cut off, but it's, it's along those lines of what Gary talked about, which is like, you want to think globally about mass extinctions and all of the ecological devastation we have, but we can act locally. And a lot of times we can get a lot more leverage with our local government than we can get on the state or federal level. And it often takes those local actions to um, build up to state and federal action. And uh, we've seen results. So in 20, just to show how things can quickly, ch things can change in 2021, uh, the, in Arlington, one of our town meeting members submitted an extremely conservative uh, warrant proposal to just have uh, new construction projects have like IPM without poison as a first line method. And our select board shot it down. They said, there's not a rat poison problem. We don't have any threats to our wildlife. Within months of them making that decision, our bald eagle died. We lost a lot more wildlife. So in 2022, when we came back with a much bolder proposal, um, which was to ban them on our public lands completely and to ask the state to ban it everywhere in our town. Um, our select board unanimously supported that and we had an overwhelming positive vote in our town meeting. Um, and we became the first municip municipality in the Commonwealth to submit a home rule petition to the state saying that we wanted to ban escars throughout the entire town, including on private property, because currently the state does not allow us to ban or restrict any pesticide, including rodenticides, on private property. And that is because the pest control industry lobbied against municipalities having that agency in the 80s and they took it away from us. In 2023, um, the city of Newton followed suit on the heels of MKH's death, and they became the second municipality to ban escorts on all their public lands and have that codified. And they submitted their own home rule petition. And I want to say that as of not even a week ago, people were saying though, not, neither of those home rule petitions will ever get voted out of committee. And Newton's home rule petition just got voted out of the environmental committee. So they're feeling the pressure. They're knowing that this is something that there's, there has to be change on soon. So to, to backtrack just a little bit, um, in March or April, I think this was early April, 2021, uh, Massachusetts had its first confirmed bald eagle death due to escars poisoning. Now I say confirmed because as Gary pointed out, there's been other deaths, but because the state didn't track those eagles, they were just not counted. They were not formally necropsied, but there was one on the Cape in 2018. I've spoken to several wildlife rehab rehabbers who had bald eagles that died that were exhibiting all the symptoms. Um, this was a bald eagle in Waltham along the Charles River. This was her only a few weeks before she died. And this is her being removed dead from the nest um, in April, 2021. And she was on top of her unhatched eggs. So when these animals die, it's not just the individual deaths, it actually takes away from those nests. So that entire population is not being born. Those eggs didn't hatch. And now that area does not have a bald eagle family. And that means there's a vacuum in the like um, ecological niche there. And around the same time that bald eagle died, I beheld MK, a bald eagle who had just started nesting in Arlington. This was my very first sighting on of her. I saw her in the sky. She landed on a post sticking high out of the water on the Mystic Lake and she was grooming herself. I love this photo because she doesn't just look mortal to me, but vulnerable, preening herself. Um, and I didn't, I wasn't even aware that at the same time I was watching her, the other bald eagle had died, which many posit actually was her cousin because they both hatched out of the Charles. And I just want to point out, not even a decade ago, we had no bald eagles in this area whatsoever in the Boston metro area. So this is a brand new phenomenon to have these again after more than a half century of not having them. And then only a few weeks later, I returned to the cemetery and then I saw one of her fuzzy chicks. This is C25. She looks like a Jim Henson creature from like the Dark Crystal. Um, and I was hooked. I was going like two or three times a week, you know, respectable distance, didn't stay too long just to kind of get a peek and make sure that they were okay. I watched them for the next several months. And this is my last time I saw C25 alive. 
Um, this was on the 4th of July. I went to see them Independence Day. It seemed a very like holiday appropriate thing to do to go see our local bald eagles. Um, I watched MK that day bring a large rat to the nest. I watched her and C25, uh, C26, her sibling, rip it apart. Um, and I don't know if you can see these speckles. They're kind of greenish. So as Gary pointed out in his presentation, these baits are um, dyed a, a bright phosphorescent green or blue to signify their poison. It's also why a lot of children get poisoned because they think they're candy. Um, but I saw that and I was like, oh my God, that's from the intestinal tract of the rat. She's eating poisoned rats right now. And they're um, in that area in Arlington Center. That cemetery is surrounded by buildings that are covered in bait stations containing escars. So I saw that and I was already feeling a sense of foreboding. I mean, I hoped I was wrong. I hoped that that was a trick of the light. But then a few weeks later, someone saw and uh, C25, she was sort of um, keeling over on a branch and then she fell face down on the grass. They took her, this was the last photo ever taken of her alive um, by Jody Sylvester. And not even two hours later, she died at Tufts Wildlife Clinic. And the necropsy did confirm um, that she, like the Waltham Eagle, died due to secondary poisoning from escars. Um, mainly brotophagum, but also bromodialone and a couple of others were in that cocktail as well. Um, so fast forward a year later, there's already a lot of um, concern in, in that area. MK and her mate Casey did have a successful clutch the following year with no poisonings. I actually stayed away from the nest most of the time that year because I was so traumatized from the year before and I almost was afraid to get attached. Um, and this happened only uh, not even two weeks after our presentation here. Um, I presented here with Gary and um, two weeks later this happened. MK was, was she's, um, you know, eagles are diurnal predators, meaning they do not hunt at night. If they are not in their nest by twilight, that signifies there is a problem. And it was nightfall and she was still on the ground um, acting adult. So people knew that there was something wrong with her. They got her, they scooped her up, they brought her to New England Wildlife Center. These are the last pictures that were taken of her. She actually did survive the first night and people thought she might pull through. But unfortunately, the second night uh, she died, she actually had, I think her lung um, had uh, internal bleeding and she asphyxiated on her own blood, which is actually very common with these poisons. Cause not only then the blood to the point where even the veins and arteries that hold the blood can burst like a volcano and the blood just comes pouring out. And many, many times these animals wind up choking to death on their own blood, which is interesting to me because it's illegal to drown rats or mice in Massachusetts because it's considered a cruel way to kill them. But we have these poisons where so many of these, not just the rodents, but the animals that eat them asphyxiate on their own blood, which is a kind of drowning. But yet that is not banned as a cruel practice. And I wanna let you know what we're losing. Bald eagles were completely extirpated by the late 19, mid-late 1960s in Massachusetts. There were none. Um, and then DDT was banned in 1972, and they were listed as federally endangered in the late 60s. It took till 2007 for them to be removed from the federal endangered species list. However, that recovery has been slower in many states, especially in the Northeast and particularly in Massachusetts, where they were endangered until 2012. And they were actually listed as threatened until 2020. So within a year of them being demoted from um, threatened to species of special concern, several bald eagles died of these poisons. Um, and so I personally think that that demotion was premature considering the threat that the that rodenticides are posing. Um, they say there are currently between 80, maybe 90 breeding pairs in the state. And that's touted as a success story, but imagine like before DDT wiped them out, but there were hundreds of, of breeding pairs. Um, so MK, and that's her again on her nest when the babies were still very young before I first saw them. You know, she was the first breeding bald eagle that we had in Arlington's borders in over a half a century, 60 years. And within less than two years, we lost that due to escorts. That nest is now gone. Um, and so uh, the day after MK died, I proposed on Facebook having a vigil um, and to march to the town hall, I thought maybe we'd get a dozen or two dozen people and like 300 people showed up and they came, they met at the town green. Um, and then we marched to the town hall and several of us, including um, Sean Garbley, our state representative addressed the audience because obviously people were very upset. This was, um, you know, this was for many of us, a friend and neighbor of ours that we witnessed, that we saw around town. Um, 
So I don't necessarily want to play this because I'm on borrowed time, but you can see how many people were there and it like stopped traffic when they were crossing the streets. Um, and it wasn't just that we had lost our bald eagles, that there was so much um, outcry in Arlington. We also in 20, late 2021, um, we also had our first breeding pair of great horned owls in our town park. And I don't know how long. And we watched them, we watched them mate all year, I mean, all winter. And then we watched the mother um, claim a nest and like incubate her eggs. This was a photo I was taking while she was incubating. Um, the babies were born. We watched them, uh, a bunch of us, like on and off would visit the park throughout the spring. And again, similar to C25, these babies were getting ready to fledge any day now. Like C25 was also getting ready to leave the nest and then people couldn't find them one day. They were like, where are they? And after a couple of days, the mother was found dead and only a few feet from her was one of the uh, babies. These were not necropsy, the birds, but um, our, our animal control officer, sorry, it's a blurry picture. Um, our animal control officer noted that they were um, spilling out watery blood when she um, cut them open. And that is a sign of anticoagulant poison poisoning because it stops the blood from cl clotting even post-mortem. The blood is supposed to tar up when rigor mortis sets in, but it was coming out like Kool-Aid. So they were showing all the classic signs. A couple of days later, the second um, fledgling was found dead. I don't know if he died either because of poisoning probably, or because he had no mother to take care of him. And that left the male alone. And that was very sad for a lot of us. You know, we would listen to him hooting mournfully over the course of the next six, seven months because great horned owls, like many raptor species, often mate for life. Um, they will, like great horned owls in particular, they'll carve out a territory, they will um, preen each other, they will, they will do what's known as a great horned owl duet where they sing to each other and they'll do this whole balletic dance display during the mating season. And just to listen to him from like May through like November hooting and looking around and his mate not being around was very sad. So a lot of us were very celebratory and joyous when, you know, I spotted on Thanksgiving day that he had attracted a new mate. This was him and his mate. Um, and we were like, maybe we'll get, you know, another clutch. But then a few weeks later in early December, she was found on the uh, ground, coughing up watery blood. Um, a, a wildlife rehabber was called an en route to the wildlife clinic. She died. And we actually fundraised and did a necropsy because we did not want to hear from the town. Oh, well, you don't know if it's poisoning. And of course, not, no surprise, it did have extremely high levels of brodifacum and other eschars in her system often associated with lethal toxicosis. Um, around that same time, there was a Cooper's hawk nest in my neighborhood that I watched throughout the um, entire spring. There were five fledglings. This is one of them in the nest. This is right after he fledged. And then that same week um, that I saw that the great horned owl had a new mate, someone reported that one of the fledglings was found dead. We also fundraised, did a necropsy. It was also eschars poisoning. Um, it was actually bromodialone, which I want to mention because something that pest control professionals have been telling a lot of people, including municipal agencies, where bromodialone is the most popularly used eschars of government agencies, is that bromodialone is a low toxic rodenticide. Even New York Times ran an article the past week saying that, and I got them to pull the article because I was like, that is not true. Um, this was bromodialone that killed this Cooper's hawk. And this is notable because a lot of people don't think of Cooper's hawks as susceptible because a lot of times they kill small birds, not mice, but they do kill mice as well. And, and some studies are showing songbirds are getting these in their system as well for various reasons. Um, and we've been deluged. So um, I get calls whenever there are dead wildlife in the Arlington or even the greater Boston metro area. I've had about a dozen calls in just the past couple of months. On New Year's Day, I had three calls alone of three dead red-tailed hawks, all of them in our necropsies tested positive. These are just some of the pictures. Um, and that screech owl was in our neighborhood and um, at Christmas also died of necro um, the necropsy showed eschars poisoning. So um, it's a lot and the state is not testing as general protocol. So we want to test because we want to have better data to show the state that no, this is a problem. We're getting these calls in all the time. These animals are dying all the time. We're finding them along the bike path. We're finding them along the road. We're finding them in cemeteries and it always comes up that they have eschars exposure and almost always comes up that it's lethal dose. This has been happening for a while. This is from over a decade ago. This was in um, early 2014, Ruby the red-tailed hawk of Fresh Pond, um, 
I don't know if people used to see her at Fresh Pond because this was a while back, but they had this huge nest at that middle building. She was one of the first, or I would say the first very high profile death that made it into the Boston Globe that the, they did a necropsy and it showed that escars killed her. Um, and after a short term kind of awareness campaign where some places gave up escars, they just went back to it. But, but just wanted to show that this, this has been happening for a while, though it is increasing more every year. Um, and that's because these poisons are becoming more and more ubiquitous. When she died, it was still a little rare to see these poisons, maybe sometimes around these um, high traffic strip malls. But now you see these poisons on every single block almost, especially any in or near town centers or city centers. And it's not just raptors. Um, foxes and coyotes are very susceptible. That's a, a fox that died of rodenticide poisoning at Newhouse. That's a skunk that died of uh, rodenticide poisoning at Newhouse. Raccoons, possums. Um, it really also raises awareness of how many, how many of our wildlife species rely on rats and mice as part of their diet and help control them. And we're not really thanking them properly because they're dying for performing this ecosystem service for us. In California, these poisons are even felling mountain lions. A lot of people don't realize mountain lions also eat rats. That was a mountain lion that was tested in, and had all these rodenticides in its system. Uh, corvids like blue jays and crows and great blue herons also sometimes get poisonings. Um, the first generation anticoagulant or denticide poisoning actually was wiping out uh, um, uh, bobcat populations in California, not directly, but because it was lowering their immune system and making them very susceptible to a type of mange mite. So sometimes when the animals don't die of the internal bleeding directly, they wind up dying of other things like mange that they're getting from this, or they're getting it inebriated and they get hit by a car because they have escars exposure. Um, and it's not just wildlife. Pets are very susceptible to this problem as well. The MSPCA Angel um, Memorial Center says that they see dozens of cases every year of rodenticide poisoning in cats and dogs. They tend to peak during summer and fall, which is usually when rodent populations get to go get a little higher and people use more poisoning and the cost of care usually is um, in excess of $2,000. This was a gray, a rescue greyhound. This was a friend's, a friend of a friend in New York. This just happened a couple of weeks before Christmas. She taught, she brought her two rescue greyhounds to an Airbnb that was listed as dog friendly. They had these bait stations on the property that had escars. Due to heavy rains, the bait flooded out and contaminated the grass. As you may know, dogs a lot of times like to chew on grass. He ate some of the grass. He died, they cut him open in the autopsy, which she had to pay extra for because she wanted to know. And because of the widespread internal hemorrhaging and like organ ruptures, they said it was anticoagulant or denticide poisoning. She's now actually having a big thing back and forth with the Airbnb to try to get them to remove those dog friendly or pet friendly certifications from any properties that have these bait stations on them because of the risks it poses to pets. Mm -hmm. This is a boxer puppy that died in January. And I this was not of anticoagulant or denticide poisoning, but bromethylene, which is the Tomcat poisoning that you can still buy over the counter. So it's not even just the anticoagulant or denticides we have to be careful about. Bromethylene is another one that people want to be wary of if they want to buy it because it is extremely toxic to cats and dogs. But really, um, to show how deep this issue is, children are also very susceptible to poisoning. These poisons, the anticoagulant rodenticides, the escars, used to be available over the counter like a lot of the others are. And what happened was thousands of children were winding up getting poisoned um, every year. And finally, um, the Natural Resources Defense Council and West Harlem Action had to file a lawsuit against the EPA. And then the EPA tried to pull them from the shelves. And the pest control industry was like, no, it's it's an acceptable level of children that are being poisoned. So this is the industry I don't want to really have us put faith in because they thought it was an acceptable level that 10,000 children a year were being poisoned by these. But in 2015, they finally reached a compromise and they said, OK, we will remove these from store shelves, but they can still be available in tamper resistant bait stations um, that only pest control professionals can put down. Now, of course, there's a loophole where you can still buy bulk quantities online. That's one of the problems. Um, the other problem is uh, that these bait stations do not at all reduce exposure of secondary poisoning because the mouse or rat can eat it and go anywhere. So that, that may help reduce child poisonings. It has reduced but not eliminated child poisonings, but it has done nothing to address animal poisonings for non-target animals. 
This is a bait station that was in Arlington Heights, right outside of the Petco, if you know where that is. And they were doing a puppy training class within feet of this and the puppies were sniffing around and I had to get someone um, from the town to come and remove it because the bait was exposed and you could even see the beginning of the green there. Um, just to let you know how tamper resistant these are. This is another bait station as Gary um, referred to where the squirrel broke open the bait station and they were distributing it, distributing it between themselves. And a few days later, these squirrels started to drop dead out of the trees. Uh, this is a red-tailed hawk right in my neighborhood. At I live near Thompson School in East Arlington where I was watching this, this beautiful hawk taking pictures. And I was like, what is he looking at? He was stalking a rat that had gone into a bait station. He, he went and flew onto the ground. There's a bait station right behind that swath of grass. Luckily, someone opened the door before he could get the rat. But just to show, I've seen this other places too where the hawks will stalk the areas where these bait stations are and they will wait for the rats to come out and get them. The EPA is well aware of the problems these poisons pose. Um, when I was doing my research for my articles, um, over 20 years, they've done like, I don't know, close to a dozen reports every other year. So they do what's called an ecological risk assessment. This is the conclusion of their 2020 assessment that the nature of risk to mammals and birds from ARs is well established and includes mortality from primary and secondary exposure, as well as chronic growth and reproduction effects. So why are they still allowing this? Well. Um, Quite frankly, there's a revolving door between the pest control industry and the EPA. Often the EPA, where after they're done with their appointments, that's where they go work and vice versa. Um, so there's been a lot of uh, really interesting investigative pieces. This is one in ProPublica on the intercepted one because a bunch of EPA whistleblowers actually came out and said, hey, we're being told to just rubber stamp chemicals without assessing them for their safety. Um, and they got fired and there's been a big issue about that. Um, but the but even so, the EPA has concluded that these are very significant poisons with um, substantial effects, um, but, but their data is still woefully inadequate. So for instance, they said something like that there's, there were seven or 800 poisoning cases over a 10 year period, I think between 20, 2008 and 2018. Um, but that's with only two to three states reporting anything. The rest of the states don't report anything, but just to show you the disparity the New England Wildlife Center, which is the place which treated MK when she died, they alone see 100 to 200 poisoning cases every year. So that is one facility in one part of one state getting almost 200 cases a year some years. And they notice that these patients are taking longer to recover and are requiring more in-depth treatment. This owl was part of a nest. Um, both parents died, his sibling died. Uh, as you can see, he's very bloody. He was bleeding from every orifice. They tried everything, including a transfusion from one of their resident owls. He still died of anticoagulant poisoning. That's why I was very upset when the New York Times was like, there's an antidote for that. The antidote only works um, so well if the poisoning levels are low and it's caught early enough. So this poor guy died. His sibling managed to survive, but they needed to give him, or I think it was a her, vitamin K injections every day for nine months straight until her blood would clot on its own again and she could be released. And they said they had never seen something like that before. But again, that shows how ubiquitous these poisons are now in the environment that it was taking so long for their blood to clot again. And this is counterproductive to rodent control. These animals are the best bet we have for good rodent control. A single great horned owl can kill over 4,000 mice. And it doesn't say it here, but it's about 1,500 rats a year. You eliminate that owl from the environment, those rodents now can live to breed because unlike bait stations, the rat is not gonna be able to outsmart an owl the way they can just look at a bait station that's stationary and say like, I know that that's poison. I saw my cousin get poison the other day. Um, the other problem is rats are, it's been well-documented, they are building biological immunity to anticoagulant rodenticides, both the FGARs and the SGARs. So a lot of these rats may not succumb at all to these poisons, but their predators are not building biological immunity. So what you're doing is you're creating these super rats that are resistant to these poisons, and then you're killing off their predators. And the reason as a bi wildlife biologist, that's called a trophic cascade. When you kill off a predator and then you wind up artificially inflating their prey. Like if you've ever heard of the Yellowstone, how killing off all the wolves, the deer went crazy. They overbrowsed the territory. They killed everything off. That's what we're doing here. We're going to have a rat city because we're killing off their predators. Um, and the problem is the pest management industry is very powerful. 
and they have a lot of influence and they either don't seem to know these impacts or they don't seem to care. Um, this was a survey that was done in 2017 of two dozen pest control professionals in Massachusetts and universally, oops, did I get that? The respondents showed a low level of awareness regarding Escar's potency or half-life. So they didn't understand the potency of their own chemicals. Every single one of them claimed to be an IPM professional. Most of them had certifications in integrated pest management. None of them knew, or almost none of them knew how potent Escar's were. Um, when I was doing my article and I asked the EPA press officer, because I said, look, I've had pest control people tell me to my face that this does not kill wildlife, even though it's clear it does. And I said, can they legally lie? And she basically told me, yes, they can. It is not a violation under federal law for the PCO to make inaccurate claims about the impact of the products on non-target animals. Uh, only the, now the state could pass a law, but it does, but ours has not. So these guys can legally lie to you about the impacts of these poisons. And I also interviewed a uh, pest control, a former pest control professional who was fired for promoting non-poison alternatives to the customers. And he told me like the biggest commission they get are from these rodent and decide subscriptions. They want you addicted where every three or four months you're refilling the bait stations. And that's why they don't, they, they don't have a vested interest in stopping them. They want you to keep using them perpetually. And the National Pest Management Association, which is the umbrella national organiza lobbying organization for the industry, um, has spent hundreds of thousands of dollars in just the past decade and a half um, on wooing federal and state representatives. The other problem is if and when these poisons do kill these animals, um, the ones that aren't biologically resistant yet, it's making them die in these areas where it actually increases the public health risks, then decreases it. Now, I don't know if you've all noticed, but since these poisons have become like pervasive, now I see dead and dying rats just around like in the middle of Massachusetts Avenue, I have a video on my YouTube where it was like 4 p.m. on an August afternoon on Mass Ave, there were little kids walking by him while he was seizing and spitting out blood and there was like dogs. This is another one. This is two, this is two houses down from a school and this poor rat was like convulsing and there are little kids walking by getting out of school and he was like inches away from a bait station. This was at Spy Pond. Two kids were playing football like a few feet away and I had to move, like I told them to move away and I got a, you know, we borrowed like a gloves and a shovel and, and threw it out. But what happens is this makes, you know, contagion more likely. If you have these rats dying around people in public areas where there are children and little animals and if they have ticks or fleas, that's gonna pass on to your dog or cat if they're gonna be dying like that. A healthy rat's not going to do that. There was also a study in 2021 that found that rats that had ingested anticoagulant rodenticides were significantly more likely to have and spread diseases like leptospirosis and E. coli. And that makes sense because these poisons lower the immune system. So these rats are unhealthier and they're gonna make it more likely for someone to be sick instead of less. Um, and that brings me to the question of why do we hate and fear rats so much? They are a public health threat, a valid public health threat. So I'm not trying to, um, dismiss that, but I do think that we overstate the risks. For instance, I hear a lot about plague. There are usually between one and three cases of plague in the entire country every year. So you have between a one in 30 million and one in 330 million chance of getting the plague from a rat in this country. A child is 10,000 more likely, 10,000 times more likely to get poisoned by um, the rat poisoning than to be sickened at least by plague from a rat. Um, but I also, you know, I noticed that there are a lot of stereotypes. I, I hear a lot of nasty comments of like, oh, rats, you know, next they're going to want the affordable housing in this neighborhood. So I do think we need to think about the stigmas that are allowing us to use these poisons. Um, the other thing I get asked a lot about is rabies. They are not a rabies vector species. It's virtually unheard of. Um, and other diseases, not just plague, are very low transmission rates. Again, I'm not saying that you want to like pet a rat if you see one um, or play around with their waste, but I'm just saying you do want to separate the facts from the fear mongering in a lot of these cases. Um, and now experts are saying, are even debunking that they were responsible for the Black Death plague um, of the, the Middle Ages, that they really think it was human fleas that caused that spread. Um, but why are we getting more rats? Well, climate change, we're getting a lot more warmer winters. And so with that, like they're breeding more and they're ha they used to like slow down their reproduction during colder winters. And now we're having a lot warmer winters, more people, population density. 
Construction doesn't necessarily increase their populations, but it does disturb their burrows. So you're going to see them more. They were probably around and we just didn't notice them as much when we didn't have as much construction happening. And we're in a construction boom right now, the past 10 years or so. The pandemic, for a while, when things shut down with the restaurants, some of them did move into suburban areas. And the poison, I think, is really part of the problem of why we're seeing more rats, too, because you're leaving out a food source for them 24-7 because it is food. A lot of them are biologically resistant to the food. And bait, the very definition of bait is you're luring them to the area. So if you're leaving these baits out, which the EPA doesn't recommend, and USDA do not recommend leaving poisons out extensively, poison is a... Poison was always supposed to be something you're supposed to put down temporarily and take away for like outbreaks. You're not supposed to just have bait stations perpetually down on every street corner. That's going to perpetuate an infestation problem. Um, and you're going to make them more likely to have bait shyness the more baits you have around because they're going to learn what those bait stations are. And they can outbreed these poisons. And once again, you're going to wind up killing their predators. So all that together, the poison is actually in part increasing the rat population because if you look at the data we have in the boston metro area the rat population has gone up in tandem with the poisons that we've placed down now that doesn't necessarily mean it's responsible but to me it's a compelling case for it and at the very least it shows that these poisons are not reducing the populations really the best way to get rid of rodents is to manage waste um, I know that this, this is controversial for a lot of people, but I do ask like people consider getting rid of their bird feeders. There have been a lot of studies that show if you have a bird feeder in your backyard, you're something like triple more likely to have a rat nest within seven feet of your home. Um, and they'll like they'll just keep coming. And I've actually talked to people who are like, well, I don't use poisons. I have a bird feeder. And then their neighbor will write me and say, well, I put poison down because they will not get rid of their bird feeder. So even if you're not putting poison down, someone on your block might if you get rodents because you're using it. Now, if you need to have bird feeders, consider at least during the warmer weather, taking them down and overnight and trying to get like a rat proof um, feeder, but they're pretty smart, so they can figure a lot out. I think that might be a rat proof one, but still um, consider some other things. And another big thing that people don't do that I, I suggest is really don't take out your trash till at least the night before and preferably the morning of to your outdoor dumpsters. And consider if you're, you're creating a lot of trash, maybe doing like a, a trash compactor, because just not having that trash out is a big um, way to help prevent them from wanting to set up shop in the area and keeping your, I actually keep my compost refrigerated until I do its drop off and looking at exclusion. And I know that Gary quoted a place that does it really uh, expensive exclusions, but I have to say when my landlords didn't step up, I got some steel wool and some of that, that like, you know, over the counter insulation when I got a mouse once and then I never got one again. Um, so it can help to just look into exclusion so that they can't come into your place and, and find out what holes or porous areas they're getting in. Um, but on the bigger level, what can we do if you're like, well, it's not just us, like what I'm doing in my home. I want to know how to get my community interested. We started a poison free pledge campaign in my town where we went around to businesses and we said, are you using poisons? If we didn't see bait stations, we gave them this little thing. And on our website, we did a little kudos like and they get a little boom in business and it, lo it was like a win-win for everyone, right? Um, there's the caveat that some businesses are like, we don't want to use the poison, but our landlords are using the poison. So we try, we don't like fault people who have it under those circumstances, but we try to give the ones who aren't like a little extra, like at like positive PR. Um, and as I said, we've pushed um, in our town and in other towns to ban these uses of poisons on public lands. Um, and we got, we submitted our home rule petition. Another thing that a lot of people don't realize is the Board of Health often will require places that are doing construction projects. Whenever they do a construction project, they have to do a rodent plan. A lot of times the Board of Health will either of a town or city will require that they use poisons or will require that they have a bait station, which often incentivizes the use of poison. So I found out in Arlington that 30 out of 32 of the construction projects in 2021 had escars in them. And when you actually look, they have to do an assessment. Almost none of them had poison uh, rodent sightings before they put the poison down. So I'm like, why are they putting poison down? And so, I mean, I, it wound up in my article, so Arlington didn't look good at the time, but then they changed it. Now the places cannot use poison in their develop, like for their development phase, unless there's like a public health risk or there's a specific outbreak. Um, so that's something you can look into doing, too, is seeing are you using poisons in your construction project in your town and how to change that. We also um, wrote the Arlington Housing Authority an open letter 
and we got them to stop using the um, ARs on their property as well. Um, the Arlington Housing Authority, each municipality has a housing authority, which is the public housing authority. A lot of times they use poison, but they're voted board. So they're a lot more, they're going to listen if they get a lot of people writing them with a problem with what they're doing. Um, in addition to the home rule petitions, uh, at Save Wildlife, at least for my Save Wildlife campaign, I know a lot of the others, we also support the local control bill, which would be return the right for our municipalities to be able to ban these restrict or restrict these rodenticides without having to ask for a home rule petition. Because it's the SCARs are the priority right now, but eventually, like I said, there's bromethalin, which also killed another bald eagle around the same time as MK and also killed that boxer puppy. There's FGARs and there's gonna be other poisons we may want to restrict in the future because of my concern sometimes is municipalities are gonna be like, okay, let's just slot out one poison for another and then we're gonna keep doing this. And so I really do think, hope people will consider that. I have some postcards about the local control bill. Um, unfortunately, the legislative session is gonna be ending soon. So it's, these numbers will change, but I hope you'll be paying attention to that bill because it's not even just rodenticides. It's like the pesticides that are killing our bees and butterflies like municipalities should have more rights to this. And this was a rally we had for local control in May. Uh, we didn't get quite the turnout that we got um, when MK died, but we got a few dozen people and we got some coverage in the Herald and the Globe wrote a piece too for um, Arlington's homo petition. And I'm wrapping up right now. And the reason why I really think it's important to do all these communities together and to work together in tandem is that these wildlife don't, sh they don't adhere to municipal borders. So MK died in Arlington, but in the days and weeks leading up to her death, she was spotted in Belmont at Lawn Pond, uh, and she was spotted at Fresh Pond in Cambridge, and she was spotted in Winchester on the Mystic Lakes. She could be eating rodents at any one of those places, and there's only so much one municipality can do. And that's why I'm hoping other municipalities will join in because to, in order to protect our wildlife, that's actually KZ, which is MK's widower, and as you can see, he has a rat in his um, talons, and this is from a few months ago, and this is on the Mystic Lakes in Winchester. So hopefully that um, rodent isn't poison, but most likely it is. Um, and just super quick, this is an app that you can do, and you can go on the computer. It's called the Earthwise Aware Escars Brigade. If you're seeing these poison bait stations, you can log them in, and you can say what's on the label to see what poisons are in it. And if you see a dead animal, you can log that in and notice if, there, if, if the dead animal is near um, within a certain proximity to these bait stations because we need better data um, to give the state. That's why we're doing a lot of these necropsies. Um, and I think that this is really going to help us get some stronger legislation in in the next year or two on the state level because we're going to start accruing a lot more data. Could you Oops, sorry. To this slide? Yep. Yes, for a sec. Thanks a lot. That's on our website too. On okay. Save Lessons in Wildlife. So it's the Escars Brigade, um, Earthwise Aware, and you can also find it on Earthwise Aware's um, website. Um, so that's it. If you want to support Save Arlington Wildlife, that's our Patreon, and that's my PayPal. I also sell these T-shirts. This is an MK graphic um, from those that picture um, series that I did, and we I just started a nonprofit project called the Save Massachusetts Wildlife Fund. Um, and if you go to savearlingtonwildlife.org, you could also donate through that. And that's tax deductible. But if you donate to Save Arlington Wildlife, it's not. There's this whole thing where, you know, if you're doing political lobbying, that you can't use tax, de tax deductible donations. So if you want to still support us in a non-tax deductible way for all the lobbying and stuff, but the other stuff we're going to do for the state campaign is going to be more getting billboards, getting commercial ads, stuff like that. And there's also a little donation jar I put up because sometimes people are like, I don't have much, but I just want to drop in a few dollars. And I think that's it. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And also on my website, I just want to mention there is an alternatives to rodenticide page, which has a lot of the same stuff Dairy went through. So savearlingtonwildlife.org has that. We have a frequently asked questions page um, and a lot of other resources too on there that, that could be helpful if you have questions about this issue. Yes. Uh, wow, this is deeply troubling. Uh, I'm glad you, you and other people are, are uh, spreading insight about this and 
Uh, I, I have one question. I just thought of, you know, like how um, DDT was banned. Yes. Is this, is that something that's very different, like a different case than this? I know Rachel Carson wrote the... You know, in my original, I do a longer version of this where I have several quotes of the Rachel Carson from Silent Spring because it could be like applied to this right now. The same stuff. It's so much of it. It is very similar. And I think when you look at the bald eagle and how we're barely getting, they're barely getting a toehold back and now they're already succumbing to this other class of pesticides, there's a lot of parallels. The reason that it's different is just our government has changed. There's a lot more bureauc bureaucratic red tape. There's a lot more agents. So back then you had a lot more of a top-down approach because a lot of people were calling the White House and they're like, we have to do the task force. And I just feel like our federal government has such gridlock now. That's one reason why it's more like of a bottom-up approach. Let's get stuff to going on the local level, on the state level, because our state was also pretty gridlocked. Massachusetts has one of the most onerous legislative processes in the country, despite our progressive reputation. And we were getting nowhere with laws on its own. And we're like, okay, so now let's pass municipal laws. Um, so I think in terms of the impacts, I think DDT is very has a lot of parallels, but unfortunately, we need a different tact now because the government has changed um, a lot. Does that help answer your yes, question? Yes, thank you. Yes, Eric. Yeah, so um, you mentioned the need to gather good data and the fact that unless a species is um, at a certain level of endangerment, um, the, the government isn't gathering the data, the tox reports aren't being done. I know that the Save Wildlife Movement, and I happen to be part of yours, um, are, are helping to do the tox reports. And how is that funded? Well, that's crowdfunding. Okay. So the thing is, like, the state will not really test these animals unless they're a MESA listed species like the bald eagle. If they're on the endangered species list for the state, then they'll test a bald eagle if it's one of the ones they're tracking or fine, but they're not testing the great horned owls. I, someone at one talk I went to said that they called the environmental police and they're like, that's just a great horned owl. We don't care about those. They're, you know, because they're not endangered. There's so many of them, but it only takes 10 years to like have that change, you know, or less. You know, So um, we're crowdfunding these necropsy reports um, on our own. It's, it's ironic because under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, you're not allowed to poison these animals. You're not allowed to even own their feathers. But they're being poisoned in this way, and there's it's just being allowed because it's secondary poisoning, so it's slipping through the cracks as something that's not being addressed. Hey, you covered that. I just wanted to ask, and you can fill this later, but um, what services do you provide to save wildlife groups when they sprout up in different municipalities? Yeah, so um, I will, you know, like when Save Belmont Wildlife started, I, I still do, though they haven't had one since the holidays. I was on their monthly call, so I would share with them, like, this is what our board of health did. This is what the select board, how it operates. This is how, this is what endorsements we got from uh, for town meeting to help roll this along. Like, so a lot of like mentoring of like what happened that was success, successful in Arlington and Newton to try to help the, you know, in Belmont. Now in Somerville, and I'm actually going to be presenting for Save Summer Mill Wildlife at their um, their rodis, the rodenticide task force for Somerville for their that has their city councilors. I'll be um, presenting next week about why they should be banning this on their public lands and what alternatives there are. I, I'm sorry. Here we go. She was first. Okay. Go again. I just want to go along with the politics. If Mass Wildlife is out and they're they're reestablishing these bald eagles. Yeah. And I'll, I'll put it right up front. I work with Mass Wildlife, I volunteer. I do not understand why they are not stepping up to the plate and saying, you know, talking about what's happening here and happening more. And with that, would it be worth it if we all went to their monthly meeting, made an appointment? and said, we want to know why. I mean, why pay all these professionals? Why pay the people that do all this good work? And then we just poison, sorry. I mean, it's a good idea if you want to go to these meetings. Um, and I, one thing we did is we went to the, the state also has a pesticide board meeting and one time we crashed it. They don't let us speak, but we like filled up the chat with all these questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I, so it's good to go to, if I didn't even know Mass Wildlife had a monthly meeting. So if they do, it would be good to go. I've, I've talked to the state ornithologist about the bald eagle. 
they're like, well, they're doing well. They have this amount of comparable populations to other states. But I was like, but those states still have threatened status. So they have more protections under threatened status than species of special concern. So I do think it's important for them to hear from more people about that. So you can write your mass, your state ornithologist about this, say, I'm concerned about the bald eagles. I'm concerned about our other wildlife. It shouldn't also have to be that they have to get become endangered until we care. That's always been, I feel like, a weakness of our policies that we wait until we're at the crisis point to step in. And by then, it's often too late. It was a miracle that we actually recovered the bald eagles. I don't know if people know the history of that, but they had to um, they had to hand re rear chicks with puppets and like by the thousands over years because like their eggshells would thin and the parents would sit on them and squish them and kill them. So they had to take the eggs, incubate them in a special incubator, hand rear them. It was a it was a lot of effort and we're doing all that now. I'm like and we've gotten a certain place and I feel like we're already not learning our lesson. It's like history doesn't repeat it rhymes. And I feel like we're doing something similar with a different chemical. Two things. One is if you do choose to go to Fish and Wildlife to their monthly meeting, you need to make an appointment the month before. Okay. You just can't show up. I mean, you can go to their meetings, but you can't speak without making an appointment yeah. the month before. We are thinking about doing that. And the other thing, you know, when you talk about poisons, um, DDT was used as an inert ingredient in chemical formulations for your properties, your land care properties um, in bags. You wouldn't even know yeah. it was in a bag of pesticides. That was 20 years ago. Yeah. It's frustrating. I just think she, and then I'll get you. Yes, my question. Um, like squirrels, do uh, rats and mice capsaicin yeah actually there there are some deterrent products and they're on the alternatives to rodenticide page like there's a there's actually some deterrent products that that's the main ingredient it's almost like a pepper spray and you pe spray it in your garbage you have to do it like gary mentioned maybe every week or two but it does irritate them i mean there'll be some that like spice but like they've done studies and like the majority of them it does irritate their and there's even a thing for bird feeders that you can put some of that in the bird feeder because that'll also keep them away. Well, maybe not all of them, but it can help deter some of them from bird feeders and it doesn't bother the birds. So that's a good question. Thank you. Yes. Not really a question, but just to add to your species list in the Beaver Brook drainage, I've been hearing short eared owls. So oh, really? In Beaver owls. Brook? Yep. So, I mean, that's another little thing. We have the snowy owls, we have the short-eared owls, and these are also endangered, and they're not on our endangered species list because they're considered migrant. And I don't know why, though, because if they're poisoned here, they're already, I mean, the snowy owl is red-listed under IUCN as threatened because of climate change, and they are getting poisoned when they come to Massachusetts every year. And I know, I don't know if the short-eared owl is as vulnerable, but I'm guessing they could be as well. Um, but thank you for that tip. I'm going to go look around Beaver Brook for the, for the owls. Um, yes. I was wondering if you know, is there any movement towards what Arlington did in Medford and Winchester around the lakes? So we had a safe Winchester wildlife and mm -hmm. uh, it kind of fell apart. Um, mm -hmm. The people were doing different things. And so I'm trying to resuscitate it and get a couple of those people interested. But I'm looking for others if you know people in Winchester, mm -hmm. because I work very closely with Myra, the Mystic River Watershed Association. And I also work very closely with Friends of the Fells. And those are two places that have a lot of sway in Winchester. So if we could get people in Winchester, like even just a few people, it doesn't really take many people, even two or three really dedicated people. Like it took one person in, New, um, in um, Newton to get that bill. I mean, she was a city councilor there, but really all you need is a couple of really strong-willed people to get a movement going in a town. So, and Medford is another place that I've been trying. We did just have a dead red-tailed hawk in Medford. And um, I... There was someone who just asked me the other day. So it's another place where I've had some interest, but then it always fizzles out. Um, so if you know people in Medford, I'd really be interested in Medford too, because there's that Somerville Arlington corridor and it'd be great because a lot of the dead animals we're getting are right on that border between Medford, Arlington, Somerville. Um, a lot of them are right there. So I'm really interested in, um, in Medford. And I am interested in Winchester, especially since KZ is, is there with his new mate and as you see they're still hunting rats along that area so let me know
Yes, Emily. I'm with um, Waltham Wildlife and um, a couple of things. We've had dead horned owls and dead red tails. I've yep. also documented crows and red tails eating rats. Uh, the one thing I wondered is if we could be more educated with the boxes somehow because I absolutely had a panic and I reported um, Waltham is still using yep. uh, rodenticide. And then I think it was Maureen that told me the boxes aren't checked for poison, so yeah. they're probably um, traps. And here I am, I've already sent letters to the patch and, yeah. and to Brandeis and saying, they're using poison, even though they said they wouldn't. And I was wrong, because I yeah. didn't know that they actually had to have a check mark. Yeah, so at Save um, Arlington Wildlife, with, we have the frequently asked questions. We have a lot of stuff about labeling. So there's all these weird laws about labeling with the bait boxes. In theory, they're supposed to be labeled if they have poison and what's in them, but there's some loopholes. And so sometimes they're not properly labeled. But a lot of times when people are like, I think this is poison, I first ask them, do you see a label? If there's not a label, see who you can ask. If it's a town or city, that is public record. And you can do a public records request and I have all the information. I know it sounds really scary, but it really is just writing the town or city and saying, this is a public records request. I wanna know if you're using these poisons and on what properties. That's really all you have to write. And under, under public records law, they have to let you know. Um, and that's what I said I've done with Arlington when I was getting their construction uh, permits for what they what was being done on those properties. So if you're seeing poisons, ask the city or town. If you think they're not being truthful, they're I think legally they're supposed to be. You can then say I want a public records request with your pest management contract and what you're using, and they're they are supposed to give it to you. So that's what I usually do before I make a claim. Either way, unfortunately with private property, if they don't have it labeled, it's a little harder. Um, you can write the state pesticide board and they're supposed to come inspect and see if things are not properly labeled. And I have told people, call them, because again, we want the board to understand this is a problem for us that these are not being labeled. Um, and especially if it's a place that you're a renter at and say, hey, I think this is poison. Uh, the affordable housing I lived at, they were saying that they took the poison out and it turned out they were just peeled the labels off and then they got caught by a renter who saw the pest guy restocking. He was like, oh yeah, it's throw to fake him. So the renters, uh, by that time I wasn't living there anymore, but I said, write the pesticide board. And he came out and he's like, you can't have this much poison. And I think he had them relabel it so that at least it was transparent. So that's what I would suggest. Again, this is all on the FAQ sheet on, um, on my page too, if you want those details. And I'm glad to answer questions on that. I see another, uh, recently Jim Joyce from uh, Woburn uh, did a, um a training on bait boxes and it's on the escar brigade and that's a really useful thing to watch because he kind of goes over what bait what bait boxes look like and how can you maybe tell what's in it or not so so that, that's um it's i think we have it posted on our facebook page but that's really useful. oh that's good it's yeah it's like a one-on-one -on -one for bait boxes mass audubon is on board now too they're having meetings uh once a month Mm -hmm. uh, so Jim Joyce was on last week. Yeah, yeah. So, he, so yeah, that's yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Can we just make a comment and, yep. a, and a question? Yeah. So the comment is, we have Lex Media here. Yes. Um, Terry's been filming. So I would like all of you to revisit once it comes on Lex Media in case there's data or kinds of information that you're interested in and tell everybody you know to go on and look at this. Terry, when will this be up and running? Um, so we released a, a three-minute piece um, uh, using Marcy's interview and some other, um, uh, and then the, the meeting that you guys had, and uh, that's on our uh, that's on our YouTube page right now. Uh, but we're going to do a follow-up um, using this meeting and the other one that you guys have scheduled for March, yeah. and uh, we're we're going to do another like yeah. a follow-up news story on it. But right. I'd be happy to. It's it's part of our news show right now, but I'll put up the individual show. Um, so you guys can share it on your website, right. and so it's easy to share. And, and you don't have to be a member of Lex Media or mm -hmm. live in Lexington. Anybody can access it, mm -hmm. so that's that's great. And then I would also say, you know, we've got a captive audience here, and everybody sort of is aware of this already. But can you imagine how many people mm -hmm. aren't aware of it? Mm -hmm. So oh, yeah. <laughs> spread the word. Bug your neighbor. Mm -hmm. My husband, who's sitting over here, was walking our dog, mm -hmm. and looked next door at our neighbor's house and there was a bait box with poison in it. We called our very environmentally conscious neighbor and he was mortified. The pest control company yeah. that he used to put ant traps in his basement just went ahead and did this uh -huh. as part of their routine. So keep an eye out. 
Yeah. And then I have a question. Yes. So if we find, any of us find a suffering animal, a dead animal that's a raptor, or should we, what should we do? Because I don't think I could call Lexington's animal control officer. They'll throw it out. Yeah, they will throw it out. Yeah. Right. So yeah. what so should we do? You can contact me through my Facebook page, Save Arlington Wildlife, or through the contact page on the Save Arlington Wildlife, or uh, Jim Joyce from Friends of Horn Pond is another person. We're usually the ones going around collecting the dead bodies in the area. I just collected a dead hawk the other day, and he actually got it for me. And then usually we see, we have like some of the wildlife rehabbers we look at, we'll do a, an initial exam, cut it open. If there's a lot of internal bleeding, then they'll ask, do you want to do a necropsy? And if we have money in the slush funds, you know, they have different people who will, or sometimes I'll crowdfund if there's, if it's low on funds. And we'll do that. For me, solicited species like the bald eagle, we're not allowed to touch them. So unfortunately, if like you come across a dead or dying bald eagle, you have to call the state ornithologist, you have to call environmental police, and you have to call um, Tufts Wildlife Clinic is the only rehabber I think that can um, usually pick them up. So I think New, New England Wildlife Center now has been uh, allowed to do triage again, but I would still love to be kept in the loop because it's important for citizens to know, like there was a bald eagle and I just happened to find out from someone because the state has had it over like six weeks in their freezer. And I'm like, have you necropsied the eagle yet? I'd really like to know what killed it. So it's important to citizens or no. So, but we can't touch it. So if it's an eagle or the other species is a peregrine falcon, you know, call those state agencies, but keep someone like me or Jim Joyce, uh, you know, from uh, Friends of Horn Pond in the loop so that we can follow up with them and they can know that we're like keeping tabs on what killed those eagles. Like I said, the other eagle that died, it died of bromethalin poisoning um, also in last spring. Like that was something also, I think, just because people were like, what happened? What happened? We had to keep following up with this with the state and we got answers finally. Yes. Who has access to the testing? Because on the Christmas bird count, a dead bald eagle was found in Pepco. That's the one I'm talking about that you That's told me about that I've been asking. They haven't tested it yet. Oh. It's still in their freezer. Mm, I don't know if that's true. That's what they told me last week. They said that Tufts has not gotten around to necropsying it. It's been very busy and that they'll do it. And I told them I want it under, again, it's a public records law. I said under public records law, um, they're like, you don't have to public records law with us, Lauren. I'm like, yes, I do. <laughs> I'll always say under public records. I just want to make sure that it's on the record, you know, that I asked under public records law so that I can access it through that. Um, so yeah, that they're still waiting necropsy on that one. Yes. Uh, this was the state ornithologist. It was Andrew Vitz. This is me. It's good to know that we have lots of uh, non-toxic ways mm -hmm. uh, to control the rodents. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just curious if you know what's the best way to control the rodents at the outside house? I mean, maybe in the yard or in the garden? Yeah, if they're in the yard or garden, I think some of the fastest ways, and I mean, this is more Gary's thing, but um, there's dry ice, like as a, you know, you can do dry ice and you find where the wrappers are and you put dry ice in that. Um, there's a way to do it. So you can look that up and there's a specific kind called rat ice, but I do think you can buy just dry ice and you find their wrapper -os. Um, And also really sanitation and looking at anything that's drawing them, whether it's your hedges or your ivy or the grass um, and then trapping as the supplements. So it would be like uh, sanitation, exclusion, trapping, and I would look into targeting dry ice um, treatments. Dry ice in the hole. Yeah, that's usually what yeah. you do, and you want to make sure there's no, you want to make sure there's no hole that's leading into your house, just because there could be CO two. You know, it's a carbon um, dioxide, and so you don't want that coming into your house. So you're only allowed usually to use dry ice outdoor in a confirmed outdoor burrow that it's not coming into your house. Mm -hmm. So if it's a confirmed burrow. So it could be good to make sure you get like, um, usually we say get a problem animal control agent or see if you can call someone to help you if you're worried about where you're putting it. Um, but that's a really fast way usually for those burrows to eliminate them. That's more humane or less inhumane than a lot of other ways. Yeah. Well, you have to find the burrows. More than one that 
do they usually have more than one opening? They yes, do have several borough yeah. openings, yeah. So you have to find where the borough openings are, and usually you have to close up the other sides so that they, they can mm -hmm. kind of be in there and you cover them. I'm not a dry ice expert, so I can't answer all those questions. That's why I think it's good to consult with someone who does that, does those kind of targeted dry ice applications. I actually know Jim Joyce just did one in his backyard too, so he could probably answer those questions better than I could. Um, I think Gary also mentioned ultrasound. Is that efficient? The ultrasonic, he's the ultrasonic. ultrasonic that's a, that's a good deterrent. Because they're repellent, they, they do not kill the rodent. They, I think that's good to help repel yeah. them, but if you already have um, a population that's like pretty settled in there, you might want to use some other supplements with repellents, and you definitely want to look into what's drawing them. Oh, the final thing I just want to say is also bug your representatives and your um, state senators, including on our home rule petitions, because even though Arlington and Newton, it's about us, if we get those bans, it sets a legal precedent for other communities as well. And it will make an impression if people who are not from Arlington or Newton say, we want that home rule petition to pass in those communities. And you call your state reps and senators, or you have your other friends and family in Massachusetts, because... Um, and the local control bill that the postcard is about, because that, that, that's important. That's more, it's actually, it's most effective to actually meet your representative yeah. or state senator in person. It's actually very easy to make an appointment with them or their representative. And they'll do I've it on Zoom. It. it works. One more quick word. I read that daffodils, they don't like daffodils, rats. So if you want to put rats, I know that I'm also a native plant person, so I know that daffodils aren't native plants. But um, I did hear that they can, that they were rats. And I, yeah. there were 12 plants listed, so just go online and see which plants they don't like. I have to like rabbits and squirrels, so I don't okay. want to throw away. And of course, I can all of them. Everybody's coming. Yeah. 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 Yeah.